Hi, Lisa here. We hope you've been enjoying the Canadian series. I know I have. I am in awe of our Doctors with Disabilities to the North. Their thoughtfulness and approach to disability inclusion both invigorated our team and challenged us to grow as allies and accomplices. I want to personally thank each participant from the Canadian Association of Physicians with Disabilities for their time and for sharing their experiences. In today's concluding episode of the series, we touch on a topic near and dear to our team, disclosure. The Docs with Disabilities podcast will be exploring this topic in greater detail this summer, building on personal narratives from students, trainees, and providers across the country, our team will address the multitude of factors that impact whether or not individuals decide to disclose a disability, touching on the legal, personal, and professional consequences of disclosure and how we can create environments where disclosing a disability is safe. Interested in sharing your story of disclosure? Look for more information coming soon to our website at docswithdisabilities.org slash podcast. We also encourage you to share the podcast with a friend and as always, subscribe for the latest episodes. Now, on to our last episode of our Canadian series. Doctors with disabilities exist in small but impactful numbers. How did they navigate their journey? What were the challenges? What are the benefits to patients and to their peers? What can we learn from their experiences? And how do these experiences differ within different medical systems? I'm Lisa Meeks. I'm Peter Poulos. And I'm Quentin Clark from the Canadian Association of Physicians with Disabilities. And together, we are thrilled to bring you the Docs with Disabilities podcast Canadian series. Over the next six weeks, we are excited to present a six-episode collaboration with the Canadian Association of Physicians with Disabilities. Join us as we explore the stories of learners and providers who study or practice in Canada. Hello and welcome to the final episode in our six-part collaboration with the Canadian Association of Physicians with Disabilities, or the CAPD. If you haven't yet listened to the other episodes in this series, we strongly encourage you to check them out after listening to this interview. In today's episode, Dr. Meeks is joined by Quinton Clark, a psychiatry resident at the University of British Columbia and the vice president of the CAPD, and Shira Gertzman, a current medical student at McMaster Medical School who just finished her first year of clerkships. Throughout this episode, our guests discuss their experiences navigating medical school and residency with multiple disabilities and the work they're doing with the CAPD. We begin with an introduction from both of our guests. I'm Shira. I'm just finishing up my second year at McMaster Medical School in Canada. I live with a culmination of autoimmune disorders and associated chronic pain. So I've had Crohn's disease since I was 13 and then also developed osteoporosis and some spinal fractures associated with that as well as psoriasis and some inflammatory joint issues and also chronic intractable migraines as a part of that as well. So those are kind of my main disabilities in medicine, and I'm very involved in the Canadian Association of Physicians with Disabilities trainees group and passionate about advocating for uh, medical students in Canada with disability. My name is Quentin Clark. I am a psychiatry resident at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. I also serve as the vice president and trainee group lead of the Canadian Association of Physicians with Disabilities. 
I do identify as an individual with a disability and was diagnosed with Vactoral Syndrome upon birth, and more recently, during medical school actually, was diagnosed with Crohn's disease as well. So Quinton, tell me about CAPD and what the overarching goals are for CAPD and for the trainee group. Absolutely. So CAPD was started in the late 90s by Dr. Ashok Mazumder, who uh, sadly has since passed away. But at that time, uh, he was a physical medicine and rehabilitation uh, staff physician. Really throughout Canada, he worked pretty much coast to coast. And at that time, uh, in his later years, he began losing his sight and became quite conscious of the absence of any group in Canada that was really advocating for physicians with disabilities. Uh, So it it grew out of this uh, group that was initially led by him and uh, met at one of the early Canadian Medical Association meetings to create a national network of physicians with disabilities. Since that time, it's continued to grow and has existed for now nearly 30 years. In recent years, there's been something of a renewed focus on trainees with disabilities. Certainly in the last two years, uh, since I've been involved with CAPD, there's been a greater interest in issues pertaining to resident physicians and medical students. And so we've been working to leverage the existing capacity of CAPD to really advocate for the needs of these trainees who are often marginalized and really not supported by their home programs or the institutions in which they work. One of the larger motivating factors in working with medical students and trainees actually stemmed from members of our group initially attending the first Stanford Conference on Medicine and Disability hosted by Dr. Polos. Uh, and seeing how uh, rich the networks were in the U.S., uh, both that you're involved with and then Dr. Polos as well and others, and trying to leverage or, or recreate something to that extent in the Canadian sphere to really try to advocate for many of these similar protections and accommodations that folks in the States already have under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Unfortunately, in Canada, we really don't have any equivalent legislation to the Americans with Disabilities Act that particularly protects individuals with disabilities. While we do have the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, which is something of a, a crude overarching tool that secures human rights for Canadians, there really isn't any specific legislation that supports uh, trainees in these environments. So do you have specific things that you are hoping to accomplish in the next few years as part of this bigger initiative with CAPD? Certainly. So one of the things that we've been working on quite intently as a group was developing a curriculum on disability for the undergraduate medical education curriculum. So this project, uh, as well as these podcasts, were funded and supported by the Canadian Federation of Medical Students, who provided us with a grant uh, to help develop both these resources and the aforementioned curriculum. And the goal of this curriculum is really to provide medical students and likely uh, resident physicians as well. Uh, We're hoping that it'll be adopted uh, wider beyond uh, medical students, Uh, but with a basic understanding of disability in terms of the separate models of disabilities, in terms of uh, legislation that exists uh, relevant to individuals with disabilities in Canada, as well as tools to help uh, medical students understand how to perform physical exams on individuals with disabilities in an appropriate and respectful manner. I I think in medicine, there's a lot of ableism that uh, is unrecognized um, among uh, trainees and among staff physicians, certainly as well. And so I think having these modules is a way of providing a modicum of education, but also an ability for these individuals to reflect on the language, the attitudes, and the pervasive behaviors in medicine that contribute to both the marginalization of their colleagues with disabilities, but more importantly, uh, the marginalization of their patients with disabilities. Shira, as a disabled learner in the second year of medical training, how do you feel about these resources being created? I think it's really something that's currently lacking. I I think it's great that Quentin and, and the group are are leading this just because it is something that's not really talked about. 
and I have found in, in my education, at least, I have had very little exposure to any training on anyone with disability, like patient or peer. And kind of not talking about it makes it easy to, to think about the fact that it doesn't exist and the fact that I think most people in medicine with disabilities go out of their way to make it appear that they don't have one if they are able to hide it, kind of perpetuates that even more. And the less that we see things and talk about them, the less that they're normalized. And I think that just perpetuates the othering of patients and and physicians and people in general with any different needs that don't fit into you know the way society is built and society's expectations. And just more exposure to that can normalize it in a way that I think decreases that dissociation between kind of the physician and the patient and them being other. And, and I think kind of that othering of the patient is a big part of what makes it so difficult to be in the medical system with a disability because they're kind of seen as something that should be separate. So I, I think it's all kind of part of the same process. You know, ableism is new for a lot of people, right? A lot of your peers, Shara, for example, probably don't even know what it is or how to define it or what it looks like in their everyday interactions with others or how it shapes their ideas about patients or the world. And so there's this call now to call it out, just to say, this is an ableist act. This is an ableist mindset. This is an ableist behavior. And to hold people accountable to that, to bring a sense of awareness to the space Do you think that trainees among your cohort, among your generation are ready for this? I think certainly everything is moving in the right direction. I I know my peers and and people I know are are really kind, open-minded people. And I think, you know, there's evidence that that kind of open-mindedness actually decreases throughout medical training, right? So I think doing something at the beginning of medical school always has the most impact and kind of continuing that throughout, although I think it's beneficial at any stage, absolutely. But in, in terms of a cultural change, starting things early, I agree with what you said in that it's easy to not be aware. And I, I think that goes with any form of discrimination in society, whether it's racism or anti-LGBTQ sentiment or anything like that, um, a lot of times we're not aware of our own biases until they're called into the light, right? So I, th- I think where it becomes challenging is that medical students are so busy and overwhelmed, even if they're, you know, if that's the main thing that they're dealing with is just medical school, that's still huge. And there's so many tasks and so many emails to get through and so many modules and assignments on rotations and the hours are so long and everyone's just tired. And so it's hard to make people like we can tell people things all we want, but it, sometimes it's hard to make people pay attention. And we just go to the thing that we know. We are thinking things through automatically. We're not truly thinking about what's happening in this space. And so there's more opportunity, I think, actually for latent or unconscious bias to impact our behaviors. Quinton, I'm I'm curious, you know, Shira's telling us what it's like for students and how it might impact them. And I hear everything that is being said, but I am curious because at the trainee level, I think you take everything that's happening in medical school and you just put it on steroids, right? So if Shira is saying that the peer group is not getting enough rest, then, you know, I I think about residency and I think you're not sleeping at all. Well, I mean, I I try to do my best to sleep, but it's accurate. It becomes much more of a job and your 40-hour week is non-existent. It becomes a 50 to 60 hour a week and then call shifts on top of that. Certainly it can be quite busy even in a discipline like psychiatry where generally our hours are better than my colleagues in say internal medicine or surgery. And when we get to that point of kind of being exhausted, especially in the context of, you know, the ongoing COVID pandemic where we're already uh, having higher than usual patient volumes and the emergency departments and other aspects of our hospitals are stretched to the brink, it becomes uh, quite difficult to take that pause and and remember the patients in front of us and, and do our best.
In the next section, Dr. Clark and student Dr. Gertzman discuss the challenges that disabled students face in the medical school application process. Listen or read along as they explain some of the barriers that currently exist and expand on their own experiences during the admissions process. I know that you are working on some things in the admissions space as well. Why don't you share with our listeners kind of what the experiences are in Canada at the at the medical school level and at the postgraduate training level as well? One thing that we've been advocating for in terms of medical school admissions have actually been some very specific barriers that have been created entirely by the medical schools themselves. So the University of Calgary, uh, in their undergraduate medical education application guide, actually has a section for uh, disabled applicant instruction specifically. And within that section of the application, they actually demand that students with disabilities notify them within 48 hours of receiving a offer for an interview, whether or not they need any accommodations for the interview process. And we've spoken to our colleagues at the University of Calgary Admissions Office in between last year and this year's application cycle. They have made some changes to soften the language, but it's it's been curious to us in these conversations why this is ultimately necessary. And think back to when I first got my uh, interview offer when I was applying to McMaster for medical school. And I think about those first 48 hours after uh, getting that offer and how excited I was. And it just it doesn't really factor into my mind why we would want to already meet these budding uh, medical students, future physicians, with skepticism about their ability to belong, their validity to occupy this space, especially when many of us would like to see more of these uh, medical students in residence and, and staff physicians with disabilities to be brought uh, into this uh, sphere and to help both improve the care that our patients are receiving as well as addressing the ableist attitudes that are in uh, inherently embedded in medical. Uh, medical training. It also feels a bit punitive to me. If I were the learner and I received notification that I had 48 hours to disclose a disability, it would feel rushed. It would take some of the joy out of the acceptance, right? That celebratory period. But I think I I might also be quite frightened because I think to me, the message that goes along with something like that is, is we need to almost certify you, right? It gives them time to withdraw that, that acceptance or to find that you are not qualified to be there. So I actually, I didn't apply to that particular university. And this also was after my application year. But I can talk more generally about some of the things that I did experience at the schools that I did apply to. So first, I think just with any medical school admissions process, there's just such an excess of really qualified applicants. And so I just want to acknowledge that it is really hard to set rules that don't discriminate against everyone. And I think there are a lot of marginalized groups that are really underrepresented in medicine. But... I found, and and it, to my understanding, has been the experience of many students who have had ongoing disabilities that some of the kind of concrete rules for application, in particular requiring full course loads for the majority or the entirety of your undergraduate degree, or also judging extracurricular activities, really frequently exclude people who have a chronic illness from applying in the first place. For example, with myself, My Crohn's disease was super, super active throughout my undergrad, and there were several years that I did all full-time courses, but there were a few years where I did part-time courses because I was dealing with being really sick. And despite the fact that all of that was medically documented with my undergraduate university, that's not taken into account by many medical schools when you apply. They just will not allow you to apply at all. And And this goes for anyone who may have had like deaths in their family, for example, and needed to take time off for that or do part time to take care of siblings, et cetera. And and we really say 
we're looking for resilience in future physicians, but I think kind of excluding these people at hand with absolutely no way for them to even describe what happened is a huge problem. And, and that goes for extracurricular activities as well. You know, some people may have spent a lot of their undergraduate degree in and out of the hospital. And that sucks a huge amount of time that could have otherwise been spent on joining clubs and activities and research projects, but probably has made that person grow and learn more that they'll be able to apply to a career in medicine than joining any club would have. But unfortunately, that's just not something that can go on a standard medical school application. So again, just make students with disabilities much less competitive in the process if they are allowed to apply at all. And one narrative that I have heard is that, oh, we can't support students with chronic illness in medical school. And so we don't want to admit them if we won't be able to support them. But then on the other side, within medical school, I have heard it said, oh, we don't need to create these accommodations because we don't have people in medicine who require those accommodations. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where you're not admitting people because they won't be supported, but you're not supporting people because they're not being admitted. And then that just feeds into itself. I think some of the accommodations, when I'm thinking about the functional limitations you might have and the way that that may be expressed in the medical learning environment, I find it very difficult to believe that even in a very lockstep tight kind of structure that there could not be accommodations made for this. And I say that both philosophically, but also through a ton of practice and experience having actually accommodated learners that share some of the symptoms and functional limitations that you might have as a result of your disabilities. So I know that it can be done. It's interesting to hear you say it, and I agree, this almost self-perpetuating cycle of, well, we can't do this so we don't have anyone in the system to even try it out. And since no one's in the system, they're using that as the driver of saying, we don't do this. It's, it's fascinating, isn't it? And, you know, how do we break that cycle? And I think the, that what you said of there aren't the physicians there or the students there who have that problem, I think that's a fallacy in and of itself. And I think there are so many students and trainees and physicians who do have a lot of health struggles, whether or not they are forthright with it or, or share that. Because there is this culture of, oh, we have to be invincible, right? And like we talked about before, everyone is tired and everyone is <laughs> exhausted and overworked and maybe not doing the things that are best for their body. And especially from the perspective of a medical student where you're thinking, well, do I really deserve to have an accommodation made for me? Like, am I really sick enough? You know, and like you said, prevention is absolutely the best thing and having accommodations that are going to prevent you from getting sicker. But when you're not so sick when you say, okay, well, I could get through it. I could get through it. Then you kind of force yourself to do that. And then unfortunately, a lot of people end up in situations where then they need to take leaves or they become extremely burned out because they have pushed themselves to a point where they have no choice, but to take a break. I'm listening to this and in my head, I'm seeing the same sort of system, right? When Shira talks about people going on LOA, because I think, well, if you're not accommodating the learner and then you're pushing the learner to the brink of, of what their body is able to handle with regard to symptoms and the only thing that can be done is to take that leave, well, that simply perpetuates the idea that a learner with, and let's just use a, a real example, Crohn's disease cannot fulfill the requirements of medical school. But it's not that they can't actually fulfill the requirements. It's that the system has said, we're not going to support this. So one enters and as Shira said, you know, may cloak the fact that they have a disability because they know there's no accommodations ready. It's, it's very dysfunctional. And the reality is that you could actually get through the system if the proper accommodations were in place. The conversation now shifts to consider how the term wellness is used within medical education. 
Listen or read along as our guests discuss the shortcomings and dangers of the wellness efforts being promoted at Canadian institutions. It's interesting to me and it has been interesting to me to see how the wellness paradigm has somewhat become the dominant way that we view disability and physician health in Canada and I think as well in the States that we understand physician wellness as something that we should all be working towards and aiming to achieve. But ultimately, the wellness paradigm really focuses on individuals. It, it focuses on, you know, the learners and, and their specific individual efforts and methods of maintaining their wellness, uh, but absolutely abdicates any responsibility for larger systemic changes that would improve the wellness or the health, not, not necessarily even the wellness, but the actual health of both learners and physicians with and without disabilities. We can see this in Canada really with this wellness paradigm really uh, leading to band-aid solutions uh, to many of the systemic issues that are, are facing Canadian physicians. I think of an example recently where we'd been advocating for uh, accessible call rooms at a new hospital in British Columbia. And initially, the design for this facility was to include one call room that would be accessible for an individual using a wheelchair, but it was to be also used as a call room that would accommodate a parent who was breastfeeding. And so when we reviewed these blueprints for this uh, call room, it became clear that on an evening when someone uh, who was breastfeeding was also on call with someone who was using a wheelchair, it was unclear as to who was going to get access to this call room or how that could possibly work, not to mention if there had been multiple people who were using wheelchairs that evening. And so we had a, a very long discussion with the stakeholders and tried to really highlight how this would need to be amended. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't really seem to be uh, communicated very well with the uh, stakeholders not able at this stage in development of this project to uh, really be able to adjust. But I, I think back to my colleagues who are using wheelchairs, and they talk about wellness, getting enough sleep on any given night. But if you're on call for internal medicine for 24 hours, and there's no call room for you to physically be able to access and be able to sleep in, uh, how, how is that going to affect their wellness? The other thing about the whole wellness paradigm is that it really is designed for those that enter medical school without disability, right? You're, you're essentially not experiencing any wellness issues. It's just generalized support to increase the wellness of those that are already well. I, but I also get concerned that the messaging around this idea is if going to a staff dinner or if having dinner brought in for you or if going to a 40 minute mindfulness course or if going to a yoga course that's supported by the training program, if those things alone don't address your wellness needs, then you've done something wrong. It, it's almost like it makes the training environment worse. Like you could be considered a poor trainee because you have a disability. And then on top of that, have another label of a poor trainee because the wellness that they've conceptualized isn't enough. I totally agree with that. To be totally frank, I find that some of the wellness narrative makes me just feel like there's yet another way that I'm not doing enough. And anyone in medical school, I think, often feels like they're not doing enough. There's a lot of imposter syndrome. And I think that having a chronic illness or disability makes that worse, especially when you do take accommodations and you feel like you're not doing as much as your peers. And then on top of that, oh, I'm not getting up early to exercise or doing all these other things because I, I physically can't do it. And when, like you said, when they when things are presented, these are the ways to stay well, but you're not well in the first place. You know, some of those might make you more unwell and you just don't have the capacity to do them. Just feels like another way to fail. And one thing that I have noticed is that there has been an improvement, I think, in 
showing the humanity of physicians and that physicians have struggles. And at my school, they have something called the physician humanity panels. And and in first year, they have physicians who've undergone various struggles come and speak. And I think it's a really, really positive thing. But I did notice a trend in all of the speakers and kind of all of the examples that I've seen where for the most part, they are people who came into medicine healthy and then something happened that created a challenge. They, they had an illness or an injury or something happen, and then they had to change. They had to confront that and change what they were doing, maybe take a leave of absence and overcome it. And then they got better and then they moved forward with their training. And it's this inspiring tale of overcoming a challenge But I think in some ways that's very discouraging for a lot of students who come in with something that's chronic and they know it's probably never going to get better. And then you can't overcome it. You feel like you should be able to, but you can't. And then there's that sense of questioning of, well, can I really do this if my challenge is something that I know I will never be able to overcome and I'm going to have to be constantly fighting with it all the time. And I can't just take a leave for a few months and make it better and then come back when I'm fully well and able to do everything that everyone else can. So I feel like that has been where there has been less role models, at least for me. And I know that they're out there. I think people are just less comfortable talking about it because it is something that is part of their identity, whereas something that you go through temporarily and then it resolves is less of an identity and more of an experience. In the next section, Dr. Clark and student Dr. Gertzman discuss the challenges of navigating multiple disabilities and their perceptions about how others view them differently based on the type and number of disabilities that they disclose. Both you and Quentin in your introductions named more than one disability. I think that we all would agree that there's a lot of motivation to hide disability status if you're able to for fear of retribution or for fear of bias in the assessment process or admissions process. You know, I do feel like there is this desire to almost treat disability like a Russian doll, right? If I can just put everything into a tight space where it all comes under this one diagnosis that I don't have to tell anyone about the multiple diagnoses. It makes me look like less of a problem in this space. It reduces the amount of bias perhaps in assessment or in admissions that I will face. And in some ways, the most palatable of the disability will be the forward disability, right? The one that that I'm willing to disclose, that the training environment is willing to receive, that's the one I'll go with. So I'll use a, a very clear example. If I just finished cancer treatment and I have to do some follow-up radiation or some follow-up therapy, that is going to work perhaps even in my favor in the admissions process, right? It's a story we can all get behind. It's something we can all champion. And it's also perhaps even seen as temporary, right? You're going to have some things you have to go through, but you've overcome this. Whereas if I'm a person that's entering the medical training space and I have chronic depression, And I just finished a depressive episode. I have found a therapeutic dose of medication. I'm seeing a therapist. Things are going really well. I'm not necessarily going to be championed. And in fact, I may have some hypervigilance in how I'm reviewed and or assessed. I think for patients when talking to doctors and trainees when talking to their program and their preceptors. When it comes to disability and and chronic illness, there's an immense amount of calculation that happens when we're disclosing. And I, I know for me, I have a lot of concern with certain diagnoses that I have. And I think it's even worse, like like you gave an example with mental health. I think that is even more stigmatized. But I find I have kind of my concrete autoimmune diagnoses that you could take the pathology and look at it under a microscope and you say, yes, she has this disease and it has these symptoms. But a lot of 
time with this disease has kind of led to these nebulous extra intestinal manifestations that cause a lot of pain and fatigue. And on a daily basis, that pain is what is the most disabling, not necessarily the clear cut Crohn's symptoms that would come to everyone's mind. But talking about my Crohn's disease is a lot easier than talking about intractable migraines because I, it feels like people can question it less. And on top of that, so when you have multiple things, it feels like the more things that you mention, the less things people will believe because they kind of get tired or there's just too many things, too many things can't affect the same person and people kind of tune out. So you have to pick, okay, what is going to get me the most bang for my buck in terms of my accommodations, in terms of being respected, in terms of mentioning something that seems more out of my control and less a sign of weakness, for example. And I think that a lot of this stems from the way that we are treated as patients as well. I see the way my preceptors talk to me before a patient comes in who has a variety of chronic illnesses and in particular ones involving chronic pain is they will brace me for the impact of this patient. Oh, this is going to be a difficult patient. She has, you know, all these things going on. Usually tends to be female patients is what I have observed, but it certainly could be said about anyone. That sticks with me as I, I know that that's the way Oh, is that the way I'm going to be perceived if I'm honest? And and is it a personal weakness? Is that the reason that I'm having all of these issues? Should I just be able to, you know, get over it, be a bit tougher? Everyone experiences pain. And and that even further, I think, stems back to when I when I first became ill, just a lot of being treated that same way by doctors um, before I was diagnosed with the Crohn's disease of not really being believed that there was anything wrong, being told I'm, I'm a dramatic teenager, I'm emotional, going through puberty, and I'm just being a difficult kid led to a lot of damage because I really wasn't taken seriously until I was very, very ill. And so that, I think, being treated that way in the medical system as a patient perpetuates that fear of being treated that way as a learner in the medical system. And I think it unfortunately is a real thing that you are perceived in that way. And so it's as much as I feel some cognitive dissonance about trying to package my very complicated medical situation into one pretty little box, I think that that tends to get the best response, unfortunately. In the next section, our guests expand on the experience of navigating disclosure and accommodations amidst the already overwhelming environment of clerkships or residency. I'm really lucky that I have very, very supportive administrative staff. I selected the school that I'm at because I had talked to some people in advance and felt that I could get accommodated. But unfortunately, as much as people can be supportive, the system is not really still set up for accommodation. So they can send a note to the clerkship director of the rotation saying, Shira is going to get XXX accommodations. And the clerkship director says, okay, no problem. But I never meet the clerkship director. That's not the person I see on a day-to-day. -day. In a lot of my rotations, I see a different preceptor every single day who I've never met before. And I, you know, I have one day to make an impression on them before they give me an evaluation. And if I need an accommodation, then I have to go through my own disclosure with that person and describe the accommodations I need because they've never even seen the email with the accommodations. What it essentially puts in place is a backup. If anyone ever denied me the accommodation, I could show proof that the program will provide me with the accommodation. But in terms of actually receiving the accommodation, it's quite disconnected. And so I think, you know, in anyone in, in clerkship, you know, you're being evaluated you, and you want to be perceived as competent. And there's an overwhelming feeling of incompetence, especially when you first enter clerkship and you really don't feel like you have any idea what you're doing. And it is just very exhausting having to navigate, okay, what am I going to disclose and in what way? Is it even worth it to me to disclose for just this one day? I could get through this one day without my accommodations, but then you end up doing that every day for months at a time because it's always something new and it always feels easier to just say, you know what, I just won't get accommodated. But with anything, you know, any chronic illness, of course, that that creates a, a kind of an exhaustion and, and pushing 
your body both physically and emotionally and mentally to a point that the symptoms get worse and then you ignore them further. Don't go to as many doctor's appointments because you don't have time and everything just gets worse and worse. And I think the the mental toll of clerkship and training, I think is very difficult for any student. I've been on my rotations before and I'm trying to learn and I'm trying to impress and I'm trying to be kind to my patients. And all I'm thinking is, I just need to get through without throwing up because I have a migraine that's so bad and I'm just trying to to get through the day without throwing up until I get home, right? And so it's it kind of spreads your cognitive and mental abilities even further and just makes everything worse when you don't feel safe to say, you know what, I need to take a step back. Quentin, this sounds like it's everyday residency. You, you can't be sick. What is it like to go through the same experience that Shira's talking about, but at the next level. So I should note that Shira and I went to the same medical school, and though now I'm at a different university for residency, I've I've actually found residency to be a bit more forgiving. We're considered more as employees, and so we do actually have sick days that we can take, which has been a bit of a different experience compared to medical school, where at McMaster, we're on a very condensed three-year schedule. Uh, so there isn't much time for leaves of absence or, or uh, sick days, let alone vacation time where one can uh, wind down and, and take some time for oneself and one's wellness. So I found residency to be a bit less stressful in that regard in that you do have a bit more flexible time. I mean, we have a great allotment of sick time as well as flex days that can be used for things like medical appointments and whatnot. Uh, So I've been lucky in that regard and have found it comparatively to be a better experience. But certainly when you're on call, when you're on shifts, when outside of sick time or or vacation time or whatnot, certainly your responsibilities, your need to be kind of there on top of things and, and being able to manage patients rather independently is very important. So I know we've talked about some of the more specific barriers to admission, but I'm wondering if we take a step back and maybe from a 10,000 foot perspective, what are some of the bigger drivers of these barriers in admissions? I think a lot of it is kind of a culture and a sentiment of the fact that patients are patients and physicians are physicians and you really shouldn't be both. And I personally faced a lot of discouragement from mentors in terms of going to medical school that very nearly had me actually revoke my admission. So I had a bit of a different path where I was um, accepted into medicine, but I was very, very ill the summer before starting. And I actually deferred my admission for a year. So I kind of had this year where I was just working and I knew I was accepted to medical school, but I wasn't started yet. And in my kind of extracurriculars and my research, I worked really hard to impress in terms of academics and work ethic, et cetera. And I really didn't disclose that I had any medical conditions. I did my best to make it not impact my work in any way because I didn't want that to impact the way that I was perceived. But when I took this this year and I was obviously not going to school for a medical reason and I knew the mentors that I was working with a lot better and and I felt comfortable disclosing, unfortunately, I was met with a really strong shift in attitude towards my going to medicine and people that had acted as my references and really, really supported me through the application process when they didn't know that I had any physical limitations, really revoked that affirmation and strongly, strongly discouraged me from going, which at the time when I was really unwell and I was already questioning myself really did have an impact on me and and very, very nearly had me take a different route in terms of career. And actually what 
made me go was really contacting the school and talking to students at the school. And they were like, no, what are you talking about? Like, you can totally be supported. But I, I think that, unfortunately, I think it is a vocal minority that kind of dissents to that. And those few interactions with very strong discouragement, I think, have a big impact, even if other people are supportive, especially in people who, like for me, have been role models and who I really, really looked up to. And I think that just speaks to kind of a larger cultural thing that maybe amongst an older generation of physicians that did not have as much accessibility at the time as, as we do now, even though it's a work in process, but it can have a significant impact on the generation that is kind of applying and entering medicine now. And this sentiment was also shared with me by career counselors at school when I when I went and they saw that I had had some part time, they said, don't even don't even bother applying. So I think making it more known among physicians and among career counselors and other people who are having that impact at the undergraduate pre-medical level on students that it there is an environment where it's possible makes a big difference because then either people will not apply or they will apply. And if they get in, they will be so scared to disclose that many people will not even seek accommodations at all because they will think it will like give them some sort of red flag. You raise a very good point around mentorship and the lack of visibility of physicians and trainees with disabilities in the in the broader Canadian sphere. And I think one of the things that CAPD is really trying to work towards, including with this podcast, is really trying to increase the visibility of physicians and trainees with disabilities. Certainly, I, I have benefited personally from having uh, good mentors in the form of uh, Dr. Rizzuti, Dr. Liao, and Dr. Kwan who have made their own path in medicine rather boldly uh, with their work, which you'll hear about in, in many of the other episodes as part of this series. But having this opportunity to really get the word out that there are people who have had similar experiences and have had similar struggles and challenges uh, through medical education was really one of our goals with this series. Often we hear that there's you know, there's no physicians with disabilities or medical students or, or trainees with disabilities in Canada, which is compounded by a, a lack of data in this area. But I think even just speaking to colleagues at our own medical schools and our own training programs, it's surprising how many people are around but really not feeling comfortable in, in disclosing more broadly their disability status. I can share uh just want to experience that kind of speaks to that. So I know in my first year, I was pretty lost in terms of getting accommodations and knowing what I could and couldn't do. And I had connected with one other person who had a similar disability, but other than that, didn't really know of anyone in my class who was going through anything similar. So it felt quite isolating and I didn't really talk to many of my peers about it. And so the following year, when the class below me was admitted, I just kind of casually made a post on their Facebook page just saying if anyone had any disability and they were feeling like unsure about it or had questions about how to navigate that, that they could confidentially reach out to me, whether it was physical or a mental illness or a learning disability, et cetera. And I expected maybe one or two people to reach out, but over a dozen people actually messaged me. And the common sentiments were that people didn't think there was anyone else in the class with a disability or people didn't want to get accommodations because they thought they would be stigmatized. I had a lot of phone calls where people were still like, even though they had been accepted, they were having a really hard time being excited about their acceptance because as soon as they got accepted, they just had this overwhelming fear that they wouldn't be able to do it because of their disability. And so what was interesting was after talking to all these people, I actually found out from the accommodations office that they had a record number of people apply proactively for accommodation rather than, you know, when they got too ill or had to take a leave, et cetera, then seeking accommodations once things had already flared up. But it actually made a huge difference in terms of people feeling empowered to take care of themselves proactively. And many of these students I still talk to regularly. And so that kind of inspired starting a mentorship program that we're hoping to launch this fall across Canada for students in medical school to be able to connect with upper years or residents who've gone through the process with a disability, ideally of a similar type, if that's something the mentee is looking for. Just because I think because we're in a 
a situation where still people are very uncomfortably and rightfully so uncomfortable with disclosing. It makes it very difficult for people to find mentors and people they can talk to and ask questions to. And although the faculty may be supportive, many people are actually afraid of even approaching the faculty and getting that process started because of previous bad experiences they've had or that they've heard of. So I think that that's a big gap and anything that increases visibility, whether it's what Quentin talked about with CAPD and these podcasts, research, or just other other ways that we're talking about it makes it a safer environment and a more welcome one for new students coming in. Well, it sounds like you're both doing amazing work in this space. And, you know, Quentin, you named some of your mentors and how much of an impact they had on your success and being able to navigate both the space as a person with a disability, but also the unwritten curriculum that goes along with being a person with a disability in medicine. And sure, it sounds like you're really pulling together, you know, your peers and even the even the informal mentoring that you, you know, I love your story that you talked about happening was so impactful. I mean, you could have never imagined, but yes, everyone's coming out to say, yeah, I'm afraid this is, you know, this is who I am and this is what, what's going on in my life. And I want to be in medicine many times, you know, the disability kind of drives the desire to become a physician, to care for people that have those same diagnoses or disabilities. I know that for many, they had a poor experience with the medical community. And so there's this desire to become part of that that medical establishment and to provide more culturally humble care, more kind care, empathic care, things of that nature. So I'm just so glad that both of you are doing this work in the Canadian space. As we conclude the podcast, we always end with the same question. And that is really kind of at the crux of why we developed the podcast, which was to provide this mentoring, to provide the asynchronous mentoring whereby a learner could log on to our site, you know, look look for a physician that has that same disability or something under an umbrella of a disability and feel like, okay, I can do this. Let me listen to their story. Let me find out more about how to navigate this space. And so I want to invite both of you to provide that advice to the trainee in the pathway. We'll start with Shira giving advice to people who are really considering applying to medical school, especially in Canada. And and what advice would you have for them? So I think it's an, a highly individual thing based on the comfort level. And, and I want to be able to say, don't be ashamed of your disability and disclose it and don't worry about it and just advocate for yourself because I, I believe that, but I also understand that that does not always go well and everyone is not always comfortable with that. So I think disclosing within your comfort level, but to the extent that you can taking advantage of all the confidential resources that are available to help support you as much as possible and something that is easier said than done, but I know I'm still working on is not being ashamed of using those and, you know, worrying that you're somehow getting an advantage to your peers or you you should try to push through it without anything special set up for you. I think just being proactive and setting up accommodations, even if you don't necessarily need them in that moment, but doing everything proactively has made a huge difference for me. And I think also a lot of things, because not many students get accommodations, a lot of these things, they're, not all the kinks have been ironed out. And so I have found just from an administrative and organizational perspective, there are a lot of issues all the time and you kind of have to be willing to speak up about them and be a bit of a squeaky wheel and advocate for yourself in that way, which is very exhausting, but is essential. I think from a more kind of emotive perspective, one of the things that has been the most meaningful for me and has helped override some of the negative aspects of, of coping with a disability in medical school has been to take advantage of the 
assets and strengths that I have as a result of my experience living with chronic illness. And it can be easy to kind of just forget about that when you're in the hospital setting and just do things the way that you're told. But I think kind of not forgetting about that has led to some really, really powerful experiences for me that have really prevented me from getting super burned out and reminded me why I'm there. For example, I find I notice sometimes when a patient is being told something that the physician perceives as positive, like, oh, your test results are all normal, you're fine. But you can see the patient, you know, is just trying not to cry because they're in a lot of pain and they don't know why. And that that negative test result is not actually a positive thing for them. And it's very hard to navigate as a learner because you never want to talk over your staff. But I find if you look for them, there are moments where you can really make a difference. Like when the patient leaves the office and and they're outside in the waiting room waiting for something and you have a spare moment, you just go sit with them for five minutes. And in some cases say like, I've been where you've been. It's not always appropriate, but in some cases it is and can really give someone a sense of hope. Or even if you don't disclose, you just show that you actually care and that you understand. And I've had some really, really incredible moments with patients like that, that I don't think I would have even noticed or gone out of my way to have if I hadn't had those experiences myself. So you can really make a difference in that way, potentially in ways that you wouldn't be able to without that disability. I really love that advice, Shira. I think, you know, my final comment would really be to the folks in positions of power in the medical education system. I think there's all too infrequently a understanding that medicine as a discipline is inherently concerned with disability, that we care for people with disabilities and through our actions, uh, we can both eliminate disabilities and unintentionally create individuals with disabilities. And so I think having this greater level of comfort in discussing disability, a greater level of knowledge around disability is never something that is going to be a detriment to students, to your faculty members and to your colleagues. And I think really second to that, ensuring that you have created a safe environment for these learners, for your colleagues to be themselves, to identify as as disabled if they so choose is really important. And I think having uh, leaders in medicine take a moment to reflect upon their actions and reflect upon uh, whether or not there are any individuals in their circle who uh, have disabilities. And if not, uh, reflecting that perhaps this is because they do not feel comfortable disclosing more so than because they do not exist. Uh, within Canada, we can really do a better job of creating these environments and promoting the well-being uh, of individuals in these environments. I just want to thank both of you for coming on to the show today, for for sharing your time and talents, for your patience in developing this series and so many of your colleagues, the contributions that everyone is making. I think this is going to be really helpful for our listeners now, but also for your Canadian community, you know, just really building awareness that, that these physicians exist, that these students exist, and that the numbers are definitely underestimates of everyone that is out there. So I thank you both so much for your time and for contributing. Thank you so much for having us on, Lisa. We uh, definitely appreciate it. Yeah, 100%. It's such an amazing opportunity. To our guests, Quentin Clark and Shira Gertzman, thank you so much for joining us for this interview. It was wonderful to hear about the work that you're doing with the CAPD to better support students and trainees with disabilities, and we are so thankful for your openness in sharing your own insights and experiences with our audience. We would also like to thank all of the people that made our collaboration with the Canadian Association of Physicians with Disabilities possible. We are so excited and honored to be able to expand the voices on this podcast to include providers from Canada. To our audience, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this episode and the other installments in our collaboration with the CAPD. We hope you subscribe to our podcast and join us next time. 
We also encourage you to check out the International Conference on Academic Medicine, which will be hosted by the Association of Faculties of Medicine of Canada in Quebec City in April of 2023. The keynote for the conference will focus on ableism in medicine. Head to icam-cimu.com to learn more. This podcast is a production of the Docs with Disabilities Initiative as part of a special collaboration with the Canadian Association of Physicians with Disabilities. This podcast is supported in part by the University of Michigan Medical School Department of Family Medicine M Disability Program, the Stanford Medicine Alliance for Disability Inclusion and Equity, and the Ford Foundation. This series was made possible through funding from the Canadian Federation of Medical Students Strategic Innovation Fund. The opinions on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of their respective institutions, partner organizations, or funders. It is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Non-Derivative License. This series was developed by Quentin Clark and Lisa Meeks and produced by Lisa Meeks, Sophia Schlossman, and Jacob Feeman.